I'd like to first of all thank the organizers for including me in this panel. Uh, my topic is pretty different, but hopefully it fits in with what we're discussing. Um, and really what I'm presenting is an example of a project that I'm working on that requires all of this data integration and management um, and challenges that I've been facing and one potential solution that I'm working on. So I'll start by just briefly talking a little bit about some of my research and new projects and how that led into um, a citizen science endeavor that um, I'm working on. And this kind of gets at some of the things that have been coming up throughout the past two days of how important it is to get this message out to the public and get them really invested. And one way to do that is to involve the public in generating data. Um, and that also, of course, helps to contribute to the research. And so I'll be talking about um, a project called Tentatively Whale Map. That's a working title. <laughs> So most of my research um, really started with gray whales. I've been working with them for about 15 years. And as Sue Moore pointed out, they can be considered an ideal ecosystem sentinel because the migration takes them so close to shore where they're facing a lot of potential human impacts. Um, and also their feeding behavior um, and other things make them more vulnerable to potential pollutants, for example. Now, I've worked with grays throughout their range uh, primarily in British Columbia, where I study foraging behavior, diving physiology, um, habitat use patterns. But I've also worked in um, Baja, Mexico, and, and I've been working the past few years here locally during the migration. Um, and we've got a few different projects going on, looking primarily now at really human impacts, such as things like vessel disturbance and also injury rates from photographs. Um, we have a couple of posters on those if anyone's interested. So as I've been doing this research, I started realizing if I'm out there collecting data on gray whales and I see all these other animals, I might as well collect data on those too. It's not much extra effort if you're already doing these surveys. And so I'm really expanding to kind of focus on pretty much any marine mammal species that we encounter um, and focusing again on Southern California. So we're, we're going to be doing transects to record the species. Um, recording things like vessels, um, any trash that we observe, and other potential human impacts. <coughs> and at the same time, be doing some oceanographic data collection, and then of course bringing in other things from satellite um, measurements, and using GIS to really integrate all this information. Now, I want to point out that a lot of my research um, for a long time has been funded by Earthwatch. And if you're not familiar with Earthwatch, it's a way for people to help contribute to research with their time and their funds help to cover the cost of you know, being on the boat and those types of expenses. And I really um, feel strongly about getting the public involved because again, I think it gets them much more invested um, and it makes them sort of stakeholders in this whole process. So some of the tools, uh, pretty standard tools I use, you know, flying transect surveys and small boats, um, using also opportunistic vessels, such as going on whale watch boats to collect data. And one of the questions that we're looking at is vessel disturbance, so that we are not a disturbance, we also do shore observations, using theodolites to track movements, record respiration rates, you know, very standard approaches. Uh, these photos you may notice don't look like here, those are all from BC, but same approach can be used here. And I've been, I use GIS quite a bit. Um, I'm still probably what would be considered a casual user. Um, fortunately, being in Redlands, ESRI is based in Redlands, so we get a lot of support. And I find that this type of image, or what I will show, can be very useful to get points across to people who are not necessarily experts in the field. So I show this image to my volunteers, and this is Monterey Bay image of marine mammal sightings, and they really say, well, that doesn't look like anything. I don't see any obvious trends until you add another layer. Suddenly, when you show the bathymetry, those relationships of being around the submarine canyon become very clear, and it, it's a nice, simple take-home message that's easy to portray. And so I really um, feel like spatial information can be a great way to make that connection. Now, some of the challenges that I'm facing as I'm developing this new project is a lot of questions about database management. Um, and many people in this room know that I've been picking their brains about different ways to do this. Um, some of the problems, of course, are 
having just large, large amounts of data, large amounts of images, and different types of files. So you have photographs, you have GPS positions, you have behavioral data, um, and trying to connect it all so that information is linked to one another and you know where that picture came from and what GPS coordinates and also other descriptions go with it. Um, and that, of course, is so that you can then make meaningful queries. Quality control is an issue, I think, for everyone, especially if you're using volunteer contributors. Um, so you have to make sure that you have standards um, before the information gets entered. And then just simple issues of consistency that we all face in terms of file naming and whatnot. Compatibility over time, being able to use um, data sets in future programs. And then sharing with collaborators is often an issue. You know, do you have to go to their location to access their information? Are you going to be able to read the data sets that they send you? And so as I've talked to people, the big thing I found out is that there really isn't a standard. Um, it sounds like in oceanography, it may be more so, but in the biology end, there really isn't um, a standard way of dealing with things. And there's different programs that have different strengths. Um, to be honest, I used to use Excel almost exclusively. And that was fine for respiration rates, it's good for calculating things, but it's not a data management tool. Um, access obviously solves some of those problems, but you still don't have state of geographic information easily accessible. So a lot of people develop their own programs. Um, one of my collaborators, or co-PI, um, has done the coding for all of our photo ID work and developed a program that works, except he's the only one who knows how to work it. <laughs> Um, Off-the-shelf programs usually are not uh, that customizable. And then there's species-specific programs um, that a lot of them have been talked about in the past few days. But again, each one sort of solves some problems but leaves others um, remaining. So just to make my life more difficult, um, I decided to develop the citizen science component, which actually I'm really excited about. But I think it's just going to obviously exacerbate the problem of data management. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, just to give you a heads up, this is a complete mock-up. I have not gotten to the point of actually making the app. These are just pictures put together, so <laughs> this is not necessarily what it would look like. But the idea is to have a mobile platform, um, thinking that lots of people nowadays have smartphones, a lot of people out on the water on whale watch boats, recreational boats, fishermen, who want to contribute what they're seeing. And it's, you know, in my mind, it's a lot of wasted effort if we can't get any data out of that. Um, so the idea would be that they would have a, a smartphone with this app on it that would reduce the number of potential species based on its your location, maybe a series of questions where they'd say, how big is it, what color is it, and then it gives them some photos and they say, oh, it looks like it's a, you know, a gray whale, and then they click the gray whale and it tells me a little bit about it, gives me a little distribution map of what, where it's normally found. Uh, they can also upload images that they take. Um, record simple behaviors, and then they get back information such as um, where they are, and they see a you know a bathymetric map that shows where their sighting was, and then they can see other sightings also. And um, the big benefit really is that the people then feel, and they are genuinely contributing to research, um, and of course this whole idea of that as they're learning more about the, the species and potentially going to the website and getting more information about threats and other information, that that's going to really help hopefully kind of encourage people with the conservation method um, approach. So linked with the mobile app is going to be an online database. People could go straight there. So if somebody records pictures with a DSLR or they just have a GPS, they could go straight onto the website. Uh, but they, even if they, they don't have any data, they can go on it and look at it. Um, now, this is not a new idea. There are others that do this. Um, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary has a great online database. Um, and you can query it, like in this example, and I've actually used this for some of our own research. We did a project where um, we found all species associations. And the one downside is it took a lot of time finding manually every time there were two species together. So you couldn't just put in a query for two species together. You said 
send me all the sightings, <laughs> and then find the ones, um, and then send a request to get a shape file. Whereas what I'd like to do in our example is it'll be a direct query map instantaneously, so it'll all be integrated. And so you would get a map sent back to you right away with your, with your query. And this could be used by researchers, uh, but also by the public just out of curiosity and interest. And of course, because if you have a website, you've got to have a game. <laughs> and really, this is um, something that can be very useful, is use the crowdsourcing method to help with photo ID. So we can have images um, of you know, different animals and have them go through and help look for the matches. Um, I figure there's a lot of online games out there, there's a lot of web app games that to me, I don't understand why anybody would waste their time playing them. So this has got to be more appealing than some of those. And there's a lot of people with you know, time to play, uh, but people like, like whales. So hopefully, somebody would, you know, if enough people go through them, they'd say, oh, that matches the bottom animal. And you'd obviously have to have a researcher verify, um, but it would narrow down your options. Uh, let's see if this is going to work. So, as an example site that has absolutely nothing to do with marine mammals, um, so I'm working with some people at Esri, and I asked if they could send me an example they had made before. And so the guy I worked with sent me this, and I asked him, How long did this take you to make, to make this? Or who did you make it for? So oh, I just made it for you. So, well, how long did it take you? He said, oh, A few minutes. Okay, that's encouraging. <laughs> so, this is just an example of how you could say, um, for example, you can add information. So in this case, you know, you can draw a shape. Sorry, maybe. <laughs> um, so you have different things that you can add in, different types of information. Um, you can obviously zoom out. And you can change your base map. All things you do if you've used GIS. Um, one of the cool things is the time feature. Um, so if we kind of you know, zoom into where we are a little bit, and then in the time feature, we can actually see earthquakes over time. And should we have some little dots showing up? Maybe not. <laughs> They're all over here. And this is the same kind of thing you could do, obviously, with marine mammals. So you can see the track of a species and follow them over time. You can enter in a data point. Um, and it's pretty straightforward to use and very user friendly. So how do we do this? Um, it's a web-enabled geo database, and I'm not an expert in this. In fact, up until a few days ago, I was just still trying to figure out how do I explain a geo database, and somebody finally said, think of it as a container. It's like, okay, I can deal with that. I like that explanation. And it's a container for whatever you want to put in it. So it's a nice way to integrate all those different data types, your images, um, data that's in a table, such as Excel, um, and of course the spatial data, which would be sightings and sea surface temperature and other um, uh, spatial variables. So some of the big pros to this type of approach is that because it's a container, it's easily shared. You just send the entire geo database to somebody else and they open it and everything's there. There's no linkages lost. You can build in quality controls. So you can build in, um, for example, a range that says, you know, if a point a sighting shows up on land, that's going to be excluded. If somebody reports a beluga whale off Catalina, it's not going to accept it. So you have certain ways to kind of narrow down your options. And again, the big benefit I see is the visualization component that's built in. And you can do some basic analyses. With the new version of ARC that's coming out this summer, they're going to be doing um, cloud-based storage, and so it will be unlimited. Um, right now it runs on servers, but apparently the new 10.1, I think it is, is coming out in the summer. The two biggest cons is <coughs> verification. If you're using general public to report data, it's very hard to validate that, um, and so you have to take that into account and know that your assumptions. And then, of course, what I'm working with is Esri, which is a proprietary software, so it's not open source. Um, but the website would be free, um, and we're talking about making a whole program that, that we'd be presenting would be freely available to people. 
So that's essentially what I wanted to just talk about as kind of different focus, but again an example of some of these issues in the real world and trying to bring it back to the public.